Hey guys, uh, welcome to our panel session. Um, oh, 10 seconds. A minute was longer than I thought it was. Eight, seven, six. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to our panel session. Today we are here to talk about um, OPI, the Open Programmable Infrastructure Project. Um, on Tuesday of this week, um, we launched this as part of the Linux Foundation, so it's the newest project within the Linux Foundation. Um, but a bunch of us have been working on this for a while, trying to get it to this point. Um, so what is OPI? Just at a very brief high level, so in case anybody isn't aware. Um, OPI is about creating um, a common set of frameworks and interfaces in software around um, IPUs and DPUs, right? In order to be able to grow this ecosystem, we really believe that some pieces of this need to be common and done in a more standard way. Um, we have a bunch of different member companies who have joined. A lot of them are represented here, but there's, there's even more. And then a whole bunch of technical contributors, contributors as well. Um, so there are different ways to join the project. We'll talk about that later, but let's just start with uh, who all is here. Um, yes, thanks. Um, so I'm Jan Fischer. I'm with Red Hat, and um, I've been with Red Hat for about 10 years. Um, this is my first open source project that I'm participating in and, and kind of working on f uh, the formational phases. I lead a couple of work groups within, um, within the project, um, governance and uh, vision and goals. So if you have any questions later on, feel free to uh, reach out. Hi, uh, I'm Venkat Pulera. I'm Chief of Technology at Keysight. Uh, uh, from Keysight, you know, we are really excited about uh, OPI because we want to contribute uh, testing, validation, measurement uh, solutions uh, and frameworks for OPI. And, can talk uh, you know more details as we go and uh, Chris Murphy um, I work for Red Hat um, I'm in emerging tech in the CTO office um, and uh, yeah I lead do I lead any groups oh I lead the orientation group at this point and um, participate in a lot of the high-level organization stuff across the project hi uh, my name is Garth Frugge I'm with NVIDIA and I'm a DPU segment lead for the uh, Americas and uh, man, we're excited about OPI, um, basically because we're excited about DPUs. You know, when we think about DPUs, we think about this opportunity for us to sort of revolutionize uh, the data center architecture with these domain-specific processing elements. You know, started with the GPU, now it's a DPU for, you know, and it was the processor optimized for data movement. And if OPI can give us, you know, uh, an opportunity to accelerate the the adoption and deployment of DPUs and data center, you know, we're all for it. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. I'm on to the distinguished engineer for Marvell, uh, specifically the processor BU business unit, focusing on DPU. And we want to help work in the ecosystem and build the provisioning lifecycle of the infrastructure, the firmware, as well as the offloaded uh, functionality that will run on the DPU. Okay, so uh, this is not a formal session. We're not going to show any slides. This is here um, just for the backdrop. This is our website, newly stood up. So I think we just want to open um, this for questions. Uh, we're here to help you understand more, or either on the technical or on the governance side of why we joined Linux Foundation. Uh, think about a question or two for us, um, and while you do so, I may put Chris in the hot seat because she was very modest about her role in the project. She's the brain trust behind the project. She's the one who started it, and I want her to maybe comment a little bit about what prompted you and how that all began. Okay, fine, yeah. I'm not the only brain trust, by the way. It wasn't just me, but um, you know, started with a small number of companies and just some thought leaders where you know, we were looking at the amazing hardware in what the vendors were creating in this space, and we thought, you know, wow, there's a lot of potential here. But it's very hard for a, you know, for a platform, for an OS, for a system OEM to think about having to do something for this space in five or six or seven different ways. 
right? That's really not sustainable, right? Some of the interfaces need to be common in order for the software ecosystem to really be able to handle all of these different solutions, right? But yet we still understand that each adapter vendor is going to have their own special sauce, their own, you know, different accelerators and hardware capabilities. So we really just wanted to create a couple of different layers, one of them being, you know, on the provisioning and life cycle management, you know, um, a lot of that doesn't necessarily add value if we do it different ways, right? If we can be common, then it makes it easier for users. It makes it easier for the OS vendors. It makes it easier for the system OEMs to know how to integrate these adapters into their systems and into their existing processes, right? So that's one area where we really feel commonality will help us, right? And be able to make it less confusing and difficult for users. Um, and another layer is an API layer between, you know, the applications and the hardware. One reason we want that is because um, we don't want customers or application vendors to feel like if they invest in here, they're only investing in one hardware solution and they're locked into that, right? We know things are going to change over time. We know a lot of customers aren't going to invest in something if they're locked in. They want options. Right? So if we create a common set of APIs for the pieces that can be common, some pieces won't be, we understand that, but some will be. And if we can create that common, then the investment that is unique for each vendor's solution, you know, from the application side is less and allows more portability and also allows the vendors to focus on their special sauce. So that was really the vision at the beginning. Um, We've obviously convinced a lot of others that this is a good vision. And now we're at the point where we want to go and you know, make it more real. But making it real doesn't mean reinventing everything, right? We truly believe that there's a lot of existing open source and other projects out there that we want to reuse, right? Because while a DPU is a separate subsystem, it has its own CPU, it has its own resources, it has a lot of the same needs that the whole like system CPU and all that that we've been working on for years and years and years. So we do want to engage with other communities and other projects and then provide the glue of how they might work together for a DPU and a best practice scenario and be able to test them together and provide a platform where you can say, on this piece of hardware and this piece of hardware, we've tested these pieces together, we've added this layer that's the glue to glue them together, and now you have a full solution that we can say, this will work if you stand it up. Um, as part of that, you know, we're evaluating different um, other projects to work with. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask, you know, what other communities are, you know, our panelists thinking of that, that we might interact with and we might um, look at um, trying to develop a relationship and or include into the project. If I can jump in so on that. So do you that. have a question? Ed? Oh, sorry. So I think you answered my question, but I'm going to ask the question in kind of a dumb way, just to get clarification. Oh, we're putting me on the <laughs> mic? OK. So, oh, all right. So. I think you answered my question, but I'm going to ask the question in a dumb way just to make sure we clarify the question or what's going to happen here. Is this a, an open source reference or is it a standards building exercise? Good question. Very good question. You want to take it? Sure. I can answer it. We are not a standards body. We do not want to be IEEE. <laughs> Um, and, and we also realized that if we tried to do that, maybe in six years we might have something. Um, so um, when we say standard, we don't mean standards in the formal, we're creating a standard, but more in the sense of common, you know, and, in, and reference architecture point of view. So absolutely, that's a great question and great clarification. We're not trying to create a signed off standard, but more a common, um, platform and way of doing things. And we also understand that one of the beauties of doing this in open source is if we provide a reference platform, others will be able to take our reference platform. And if there are pieces then you want to change and tweak, 
you can do that, right? It's just a common base to start with that'll allow the ecosystem to grow and then people can focus just on the piece that they want to differentiate on or you know, switch out and make different. So if I can jump in on that. Um, I am also the rep, the representative from Marvell for o one of them, for ORAN, Open Radio Access Network Alliance, as well as the Spiffy Spire um, CNCF project for workload and node attestation. And I've been running between these organization meetings for the last two months or so. And um, I'm trying to push, for example, OPI should look at Spiffy and Spy for node and workload attestation. ORAN is already interested in OPI and the DPU in their radio unit, distributed unit, and central unit, and the whole security layer. And so, you know, we are trying to serve as the foundation, but not necessarily a full SDO, if that helps. Yeah, so Antu actually brought up a, a good point here. I do, if, if I may, I wanna do a little quick uh, show of hands to just understand something brought you in into this room today. So we're trying to understand what you guys do and what you may be more interested in. So how many folks here work for vendors? What kind of vendors? Hardware or software? Hardware? Soft, software, okay, <laughs> both. <laughs> How many folks are here would consider themselves uh, user customers uh, of potentially of this project? Okay, couple of folks. And how many people are associated with other open source projects on the Linux, found, Linux foundations or elsewhere? Okay, quite a few folks. So that gives you a little bit of a background on you know who's here and why. Possibly. Uh, here's a question in the audience. Thanks, Jan. I, wa I wanted to ask, um, how do you all envision end users participating in this community? I assume that that's an important goal. But if, if, I'm, a, if I'm someone who wants to use DPUs or a set of DPUs, um, what's in it for me to get involved with this? Great question. Uh, jumping off, SDK, we have an SDK that you can leverage. And I'm talking to my boss later today about possibly building layers on top of that to support some of the application. Uh, because the SDK is more about system and firmware. And now if you're going up to layer four to layer seven networking, for example, or even all the way to layer seven where Spiffy and Spire play, you know, we can help with extensions or some form of, and I'll pass it to my colleague here. We can talk about Doka. Yeah, I mean, if you're a customer and you're developing applications for a heterogeneous environment, um, then it's important, right? Because you want to invest in that application development and you want that application to be portable across DPU vendors. Some of our customers want that, right? Some of them don't, right? And we, we have other tools for that. But for me, from an end user perspective, I mean, that's the real value. And what we're doing is, you know, we're pushing in the lower level uh, drivers where we're opening up the APIs associated with our SDK called Doka. And we're pushing these in to, to uh, OPI. You can kind of create a common API shim layer so that you can develop those applications and interface in a common way across DPU vendors. And I think that's the real value, I mean, from our perspective. Okay, I can, a couple of more things, I mean, when you want to get involved, right, just looking at the title itself, you could have seen, it's fairly broad, right? And then we're not expecting everyone to be a C programmer or whatever, you know, C++, uh, you know, Python, whatever else to come in contribute, right? You could have use cases, you could be an end customer. So we do encourage, we do want you to come in and just give us the problem and say, hey, solve this problem for me. And then we want to pick up the most valuable problems that are useful for you. It could be at that high level, right? I just throw a problem. Or you could come down and say, you know, I can help you look at, hey, you know, multiple uh, different ways of implementing a functionality. Each vendor does it differently. And I am an expert in either APIs or interfaces and things like that. And how do we bridge uh, the inter common interface, right, that we want to build across vendors. It could be, you know, it's one layer below, but you could do that. Or you may be some expert in storage and you are really the guru in, uh, you, know, uh, you know, how to create that interface, right? So you could be coming and helping us with, uh, you know, implementation. So I think we have a broad set of requirement, a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, groups 
that are, uh, it's not a monolithic thing. We have, you know, uh, groups that meet and uh, tackle different problems. So please come look at the website and find the right, uh, uh, right group for you to join and contribute. To, to add to the uh, DOCA and the common shim layer, um, in ORAN, we're looking at something called hardware abstraction manager with the accelerator abstraction layer, which is essentially ORAN shim, right? RAN shim. So we can work on that. Uh, end user are already engaged. They want to, you know, where ORAN is going full speed ahead. The other um, application area is automotive. Um, I've done some subtract, uh, abstract submission for security on DPU inside the zonal uh, gateway and the central gateway to the far edge. So there are many, many ways to get engaged. It depends on what your requirements, need, use cases are. And just to pitch Marvel, uh, <laughs> We have a very excellent track record with working with customer to make sure that your projects are successful. And, and we do specifically have a use cases subgroup already, and we would love more customer input to that. We already have some that are engaged in saying, these are the use cases where we want to start. Because DPUs cover such a broad spectrum, everything from networking to storage to crypto, there's so many things we could start focusing on, and it's a huge ocean to boil. So having customers show up and say, this is what we're most interested in as a starting point, that's, that's a really, really important input for us. So definitely encourage customers to join us for that. Uh, yeah, and this, is probably, this is probably a good segue also to um, talk about how you can engage with us and what you can do. So what you see behind you is our um, .org website. It, will, it has some links on how to contact and join us. Um, we do have a GitHub set up. Uh, it does have a representation of all of our working groups. Uh, you could explore that. You could see where you could contribute. There are names of the leaders of the groups. Um, they are listed, um, the ways to contact them, and short description of the work group that, that exists. Um, this is absolutely not uh, too late to actually join the project. I mean, we just went through the formation phase, as Linux Foundation calls it. So we essentially became a part of the Linux Foundation. But there are ways to get included, um, and there are definitely ways to influence this project, whether you want to do that um, as a part of, um, you know, a governance board and, you know, with a premium membership or whatever, uh, or just as a technical contributor. I think today we definitely looking to see who can join our group and represent um, other categories of interested users, like you heard today from various different verticals, automotive, uh, edge networking, IoT, etc. cetera. Um, and, and I think we definitely looking to have the engagement um, across the board. So from starting from the uh, technical working group um, as, or as a part of the TSC in general, um, or uh, on the uh, kind of more of a um, outreach and origination of the uh, project uh, side, uh, making sure that the, uh, uh, the word of this project kind of gets spread around, right? So um, I think that's, uh, that's probably is a good time to see if there's any other questions. Anything online? Um, any questions online by chance? Okay. Well, speaking of the use case subgroup, there's a POC subgroup, and just maybe to give you guys some uh, ideas of, you know, this is all very nascent, but there's one right now on distributed next generation firewalls. So if you're interested in, in cybersecurity, how DPUs can help kind of uh, enhance security of data center infrastructure, you know, this is a great POC group to, to join. And the goal is, I believe, to have 20 of these kind of set up in the near future. So, so one other way, uh, right, I mean, uh, you may be, like some of you are already part of other Linux Foundation projects and other uh, pro open source projects out there, right? So uh, one way you could help is also to kind of bridge, you know, create, you know, help us bridge with some of the existing work out there. You see something that overlaps that we could use. By no means we think that we want to reinvent the wheel or recreate anything. Whatever is existing there, and you know, we want to learn from the best practices, design patterns, whatever else you have, right? 
and then and each of us are also as you know representing our companies we are part of other groups right uh, and we are actively trying to engage with them and uh, you know bring them on board and interface with them and i can talk about a couple of them right so uh, if you are in the uh, sonic sai uh, you know ecosystem right uh, which again if you have seen you know google facebook and a lot of others have joined to use sai as a, a switch abstract this is on the networking side right switch uh, switch abstraction interface and then there is a lot more work going on even at the sonic sonic has uh, just moved to linux foundation uh, that's going to make it even more appealing to a lot of us right uh, and then the, the one of the dpu projects under sonic that's happening is called dash which is uh, uh, disaggregated or distributed api too many acronyms right <laughs> <laughs> disaggregated apis for sonic host right how do we take uh, uh, dpus and use it in a, in a, in, a, in a specific use case which is Uh, which is like an appliance form factor, or might become a smart tower. So there is some good work going on there. Keysight is part of that. We are providing a testing framework there, and some of that learning we want to bring it here. Like that, you may be part of other groups. We want you to, you know, bring that, and then we would like to use that to kind of get ahead, get fast. Otherwise, like you said, Chris, it will take seven years to come up with the so-called standard, right? We want it to be seven months, right? And there are other groups like PNA. So because one of the things we are talking about is programmability. on the data plane side on the switching side there is p4 ebpf there's a lot of programmability work going on so we are also engaging with the p4 as well as pna which is programmable nic architecture so there's a nic subgroup under p4 we want to engage we are already engaging uh, you know that's that's the uh, that's the kind of work that we want to bring in uh, one more work that is happening under ocp is this is more like a functional acceleration there is a OCP NIC group, I think they it just got launched. Uh, I think uh, I, I, I see good overlap, which is good. Uh, at the same time, uh, it, uh, I think if you see OPI has uh, you know little more programmability to it because DPUs are bringing this new functionality, statefulness, lots of flows and things like that. So so there's some more work we can uh, really work with them. They are looking at functional offloads. Anything that happens here, we would like to engage. If you are part of that group. please talk to us otherwise you know we are actively going engaging there's one more i have seen uh, sorry i'm going i'm going off so if <laughs> stop me when you have a question right go for it so there is because there lots of groups you know opi is covering a broad set of infrastructure we would like it to be that way while we will focus on specific use cases uh, the more valuable ones right the last one and i'll stop after that is uh, is there something called open snappy i think uh, they are looking at uh, uh maybe i may be mischaracterizing so correct me if somebody uh, knows more about it it's more of how do you do work uh, you know uh, workload placement because once you have this broad set of programmable functionality you will have like a hybrid uh, distributed uh, uh, abilities right so how do you kind of optimize it right because you know how do you uh, right so there are looking there's some very good work happening there and that will be very useful for us and we hopefully we'll engage with them uh, uh, this is more about work placement that suits the uh, the infrastructure and it becomes more complicated because programmable right it becomes what you want it to be it takes the problem to the next level so so we have some serious challenges and problems we need to solve at the same time we can definitely learn and use some of the work that is happening in all these other groups just just one more project i want to pitch for is open telemetry so far we have decide to settle on uh open telemetry as our way to collect metrics and allow of higher uh, consumer of those metric to be able to get into the dpu data so i want to pitch that because the open telemetry people were very kind on monday when i mentioned that opi was looking to adopt uh otel So yeah maybe this is a good segue to um I don't know how closely you were watching the announcement or following the announcement um maybe we just should do a quick recap of who actually joined and who are interested parties that for a variety of reasons that has nothing to do with either Linux foundations or the people we're working with were not able to join by the date when we made the announcement but they will be joining later so the founding members are Marvel Nvidia Red Hat Keysight Intel Dell and Tencent. Tencent. Uh and Tencent didn't make it through their PR and legal approval so they were not in the press release but they have 
uh, since already committed to the Linux Foundation. We also have uh, definitively heard from AMD and the Xilinx division. Um, that's kind of in the making, so I can comment when and how they will be joining. But if you uh, go and look at the list of committees on the uh, GitHub and look at the proceedings of um, our in inaugural event, that was basically a virtual event where we all got together and listened to why people would be interested in joining the project or why this project is even needed. You could get there by going into About on the website, and there is a, there is a video recording of, of those proceedings. You'll be able to see that we actually uh, um, interacted and tried to pull the community in. So um, we do have interest from Google to participate. We have Verizon, Comcast um, actually joining various groups that, that we have. We have representatives from Canonical, SUSE, and um, a couple of folks from VMware. So this is, if not immediately, this is going to be um, a pretty good representative body of uh, who is who in the industry from the vendor standpoint. And we also certainly hope that customers will see through and, and definitely will um, jump on board and help us to make this a truly you know, community, truly open community. And to add to that, the launch on Tuesday, um, if you're wondering, conflicting schedule, but Dell and F5 were there. So they are founding members as well as um, heavily involved. Yeah, that might be bad. I forgot about F5, which is, but they were one of the first people to, uh, to actually join the, the, uh, the project and they yeah. were working very closely. There was a couple of companies at the beginning that we were talking, F5 was one of them. Yeah. <laughs> so. uh, you know, distributed firewall and DPU make total sense, right? Okay, so the question is, uh, somebody said this is not FPGA, right? FPGA. FPGA, yeah. So I, I'll answer and then you, uh, you, know, you can chime in, right? So if you look at, uh, a while back we had servers, we have hardware, which is CPU, you have OS, and then you have applications, right? And then some things people wanted to accelerate, so they started putting things into the NICs, called functional NICs, and they became smart NICs, where they started putting FPGA, Excuse me, FPGA so that you can program it and then you can change what you want to do, with, uh, the functionality, uh, maybe at runtime, right? And from that, I think what we have evolved to is uh, something called DPU, IPU based NICs, and that's what we are talking about. And some, uh, maybe I should let the vendors who really do <laughs> to give talk more about it, but as a user, uh, this is exciting because the, there's a new functionality that is coming into picture, which is a lot of state. You can track lots of flows, and you could do things that you know we used to do as part of uh, the switches. Our uh, servers were always software, right? The switches and routers that we used to do like flow-based, either firewalling or load balancing, WCCP. If anyone is old enough to know and worked on it, so these kinds of things used to be part of the routers uh, and switches, and they went away because of the statefulness and the speeds and feeds. So that level of functionality is coming back into the IPUs and DPUs. And maybe I should, yeah. Cisco route is showing. Okay. Maybe uh, yeah, 20 I years mean, in Cisco, uh, sorry for that. <laughs> uh, so the question is, is it FPGA? Well, this kind of gets into the semantics of what is a DPU, how do you differentiate a DPU from a smart NIC and a smart NIC from a standard NIC? And really, uh, you know, we may even have differing opinions on that. From our perspective, uh, we're talking about, you know, smart NICs introduce this idea of an accelerated data path. So we're accelerating, you know, those packet processing sort of uh, tasks that are super heavy on the CPU, but the control path still remains on the x86 host. So there's still the dependency to the host. Now with a DPU, whether you're enabling it with ARM cores, whether you're enabling it with an FPGA or whatever, the idea is that you're able to accelerate the data path you're able to offload the control path, create some independence from the tenant domain versus the infrastructure domain. And by doing so, you end up actually being able to air gap, right? You're air gapping your tenant domain from your infrastructure domain. And, and so you're bringing enhanced security. So uh, somebody's DPU could be based on an FPGA, somebody's DPU can be based on ARM cores, somebody's DPU can be based on whatever processing element they may use. 
um, you know, the idea is offload, accelerate, isolate, and, and, and you can have this sort of independence from host. That's our perspective. Yeah, but very early in the project, and one of the first groups that we formed was the minimum requirements groups. And that group was, the sole purpose of this group was to define what are we going to consider DPU and IPU. And um, when we got to a point where, you know, enough folks were participating, uh, one thing emerged for sure, and Garth highlighted it, it's the independent processor that is separate air-gapped or there's a trust line between the server or the host machine and, and the, uh, the actual uh, DPU and IPU. How that core is implemented, it's, to me, is just a technical detail. It could be a soft core in FPGA, it could be uh, you know, any particular vendor implementation, any ISA that you want, as long as it's programmable using the parts of the OPI project and we can address that through the APIs. Actually, I was gonna say something to this. Um, first is, mental blankness, not enough caffeine this morning, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. No, I was gonna say this, the separation of concern and the offload of the certain control plane and data plane functions play very nicely into some of the Red Hat uh, OpenShift, so, um, Wind River Cloud Platform, VMware Telco and um, Cloud Automation because all of those use cases and customers have the concept of tenants versus core, right? Versus infrastructure. So I think I'll, I'll let Chris. Um, yeah, I can comment on that in a second, but back to the original question. Um, I think maybe they were getting at, is this going to be code for programming FPGAs? Oh. And the answer is no. <laughs> That's, I mean, when you look at the title, open programmable infrastructure, I can see how people might think that this is, you know, a project for programming FPGAs. And that is not what this is. So, <laughs> to get back to, there, there are, there are absolutely other projects for that. Um, Hugh is involved in No. So, if there are people who want um, Hugh Brock from Red Hat, um, you know, could in, engage and tell you guys about that stuff as well. Um, but yes, on the the tenant versus infrastructure layer, absolutely, Kubernetes is you know well suited to um, be an answer there for doing that. And Red Hat is very much looking at you know, cluster designs for DPUs where we have, you know, one cluster that is your tenant cluster and a separate cluster that your DPUs belong to that is your infrastructure cluster, you know, because then you can have where your admins for your infrastructure only have access to the DPU layer. They don't have root level access to that tenant layer. So you can tell your customers that, yes, even our system admins can't access stuff in there and, and potentially have root access to your data. And vice versa, if you have you know, a tenant workload that goes rogue or you know, somebody is able to penetrate a vulnerability somehow and get into you know, your, your CPU layer, they can't then you know, broaden out to your entire cloud because they don't have access to that infrastructure layer. You know, that's where that security, that security air gap is so important, right? Um, and, and we've seen so many things across the last five years where I think most of us who are in you know, this business understand that being able to isolate in a way that even if there is a vulnerability and somebody gets in, they can't get into everything is huge. So to amplify on that, uh, one of our focus internally is security, especially in the area of SBOM, GitBOM, and the open Secure Software Foundation, because we understand that, you know, in the past, you log in, you download our SDK and our firmware, but now it's not so much a single admin doing that, or multiple admins, now it's automated, and it has to be verified, attested, and all that. So that's another area I wanna bring in security. And the other thing we forgot to include is the big semiconductor, Intel. Well, no, I mentioned Intel, of course, yeah. Oh, we sorry. We'll probably talk a little bit about IPDK. I don't know if Chris wants to. Yeah. Can I just add one and yeah, then we'll go, go back? It's, it's good that we have so many names we're forgetting, right? I think you know the, it, it, yeah. you can see the adoption part of it. So 
going back, right, this FPGA question, I think things are going to get worse. Bad news is it worse before they've improved. What I mean by that is we'll have soon chiplets where there's a bit of FPGA, a bit of, uh, I mean, this is what I hear, is something called C of cores, you put a bunch of cores to do. So when you say DPU, IPU, there'll maybe more terminology will come out and there could be a little more confusion. I think we are timely to really launch the OPI because no matter what you have, we would like to have a common interface and it is programmable, you expose your programmability and look at it as an infrastructure. I think it's very timely and if we don't do it soon enough, I think as an industry, we'll really have a lot of difficulties, at least especially, right, when you want to develop applications on top. So, so it's going to get a little muddy before it gets clear. So a quick question. So I've come from, I used to work for VMware, now I work for Dell, but I'm looking into Kubernetes and containers. So I see that every time there's a new abstraction layer, right? Because VMware came with an abstraction call for you know virtual networking and there was virtual storage. Now Kubernetes has abstraction CSI on storage side. There's of course you know other things and also on the networking side you have Istio service mesh. So how does the OPI kind of you know, address that from that? Like you're getting more and more abstraction. You're getting pulling the storage and network functions more and more to each and every abstraction, and does the OPI now you're kind of separating the whole compute infrastructure away from the storage and networking. That's what I'm understanding, it's like you're abstracting that away. So how does that impact this overall Kubernetes ecosystem, like the service mesh, the CSI, you know, all the whole storage services, things like that? I, I, can, I can give uh, half of the answer and pass it to others who are experts, right? Because I was going around uh, the, the exhibition hall and looking at you know what all is being discussed, right? I see multiple solutions at multiple layers, right? Initially, there are certain level of abstraction at the node level. Somebody wants to do a cluster. Somebody wants to do a gateway. Somebody wants to do a service mesh. They're all they came into existence because they are solving some unique problem, uh, right? Out there. So I doubt if they will go away. The layers and the the a sequence of layering of these solutions may not go away. Right? And if you talk about multiple implementations and you know each one is doing different and how would they come together, I think common, open, programmable infrastructure is supposed to be the solution, right? So, but the layering to me adds value. Uh, the, the, there is a uniquely why you need service mesh as well as you need a, a gateway, right? So, so, so to that extent layers, yes. Uh, other, uh, you know, how do we bring it together? Maybe others can. Um, to jump in. For one of our um, sandboxes, we're looking at things like K3S instead of KAS, and Multus, and Calico, CNI. So there are things like that that we're looking to build for a customer, and we're trying to figure out how we can extract some of that to contribute. Um, so yeah, I came from VMware, and then before that, Cisco, right? So this stuff is always in the back of my mind how to leverage DPU to do. Um, I would say that from a Kubernetes standpoint, you know, when we're talking about doing it as different clusters, it's a whole server, it's a whole subsystem to Kubernetes, right? So a lot of those same things are going to exist exactly as they do, you know, up on your host CPU layer. So we're not going to try to reinvent how you abstract that part, you know? We will reuse CNIs, we will re reuse a lot of those things that exist already. The abstraction part is more the, you know, how you talk between those things, between a CNI or a networking storage layer, and how to program the specific hardware accelerators and features within this new hardware, you know, category. category. Yeah, right. And so it's it's not recreating those wheels and re and, and reinventing those abstraction layers, right? It's more um, hiding the unique hardware features where we can so that those things can interface in a consistent way across multiple vendors. Maybe you have some yeah, comments. No, I agree. I mean, it's, uh, it's more about where the abstraction resides and how those services, services are presented to the tenants. Uh, it's not about creating kind of something new. We, yeah, we have two minutes, which is oh, probably one. one minute. Wow. Okay. So maybe one last question or. Yeah, actually, you know what? Let, let me just. 
I know Jan did pitch about how to interact with us as a community. I just want to make sure that people understand, yes, your company can join as a paying founding member, but for technical contributions, there's no monetary contribution needed. You know, if you're a user, if you're, you know, another company who is interested, if you're involved with an open source community and you want to get engaged with us, come. We want you. We want to talk to you. We have Slack. We have options. You know, if all else fails and you can't figure out how to get in contact with us, hit me up on LinkedIn, <laughs> and I'll figure out how to get you guys. Um, well, I am the orientation group, so I will get you connected. Um, so we want you there. There's no commitment to come and talk to us and start, you know, thinking about how we can engage. So, so reach out. You know, don't wait. Now's the time to have a huge influence on where we go. So come and interact with us. Very well said. And I want to thank everyone here and online for joining us. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks to the panel Thanks. as well.